Hello and welcome to Portfolio Matters. In today's sh shares talk, we will be discussing the interesting British listed US gas company, Diversified Gas and Oil. But before we do that, Richard will read the disclaimer. Everything discussed during the Portfolio Matters podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. Listeners should be aware that we will be discussing securities that we own or have a financial interest in. Please do your own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. A full disclaimer can be found at the end. Okay, take it away, Keith. Thank you, Richard. <clears throat> okay, so this is a very interesting company which has a very different business model to any other oil or gas company I've ever analysed. Um, Essentially, the US shale gas industry as a whole is notorious for having burnt through vast quantities of investor money for the last 20 years. And diversified gas and oil actually are primarily interested in returning cash to shareholders. So what they do is they buy old wells and then they try and maximize the return of those old wells. So they're kind of oil and gas scavenger company mm -hmm. that's primarily interested in returning cash to shareholders rather than growing production. Now, the reason we're interested in it here is that it has an amazing yield. The yield is 10.7% and it actually grew by 14% last year. So this just seems the perfect investment. It's high yield with a growing dividend. So the question we want to answer is, do we think that is sustainable? And with some caveats, we think it could well be. So it's also, as I said, growing. Um, so their assets and their buying and the size of the company has grown very quickly recently. And they have a new funding arrangement, which gives them a billion dollars worth of firepower to buy more assets and expand the company further. Is that equity or capital or um, loan funding, Keith? It's, as you'll see as we go through, Richard, it is 50-50 um, asset sharing. So they will deploy the capital and then they'll split the revenues initially 50 50 with oak tree capital right and then after various return hurdles have been hit the um profit split will go five percent in dgoc's favor right. uh, the other only other thing i should mention at this stage is that it's a u.s company that's listed in london and that means that you will have to pay withholding tax of 15% on the dividends unless you buy the shares in the SIP, in which case you should pay no withholding tax. So diversified gas and oil is a primarily a gas producer concentrated in the Appalachia region of the continental US and it buys legacy gas wells and aims to make its money by specializing in extracting as much gas from these legacy wells as possible. Mm -hmm. And you see here on this chart, this is what it does. So the green line is the production profile of a shale gas or oil well. And what you'll see is there's a very sharp spike up in initial production, then a rapid decline. And most of these um, oil or gas wells will see product falls in production in the first year of up to 60 percent. Right. So if you're producing 100 barrels per day oil equivalent on day one, on day th 365, you could only be producing 40. So there's very rapid initial declines. Yeah. And so what um, diversified gas and oil do is they come in and buy it after about five years when production has fallen very substantially. 
So what, is the, what is the vertical dotted line in this graph, Keith? It's when they buy it. That's, right. that's kind of the point at which DGOC comes in and buys the asset. Is that now, the point at which they're... Um, okay, so they, they are after the exponential decline. Yes. They're on a more linear slope. Exactly. They're, but at the same time, production at the, that time is generally quite low. They have a lot of wells that are producing not much. Okay. Now, the reason the, the uh, oil company or gas company wants to sell these assets is because they need capital to invest in new wells. So the gas companies, their business is drilling new wells and specializing in you know, peak production. So they want to keep on growing production and they're not interested in having lots of low producing wells on the book. They'd rather drill some new wells and get a big uplift in production. Yeah. Um, so this is where the business is concentrated. It, you can see from this map that they're in West Virginia, Ohio, Ohio and Pennsylvania with some in Kentucky and Tennessee. And what they do is they buy the wells and the land that the wells are on, and they only pay for the wells. If there is any land that's undrilled, they will also try and drill that. And that gives them an immediate uplift. Okay. So in some way, we think this is an interesting company that seems to have a sustainable and growing dividend yield. The dividend yield is currently 10.7%. And if you invest in a company with a dividend yield of 10.7%, you will double your money in seven years, assuming that you pay no taxes. So if you put this in a SIP, you know, you double the value of your SIP in seven years. I mean, that is a very, very serious di dividend yield when um, the interest rates in your bank are 0.1%. Yeah. Um, the dividends are well covered, so it pays out about 40% of free cash flow. And it, has, it claims to have a demonstrated ability to prolong asset life. Now, it claims that on the basis of having been in business for something like five years. But when you listen to interviews with the CEO, he is very bullish on the company. And it seems when we go through these charts that they um, are kicking off a lot of free cash flow and being able to repay all the debt. So what they do is the moment they buy um, an asset, they immediately hedge future productions so that they are sure that they can repay the borrowings. So what that means is they hedge about 80% of production. So they hedge it to the, basically they hedge it for the term of the borrowing. Is that right, Keith? I believe so. Yeah. So what that means is they're not as exposed to the oil and gas price as is a normal oil company. Mm. And so last year when gas prices collapsed, they made a lot of money on their hedges. This year, when gas prices have gone through the roof or have recovered strongly, they are not participating in that. Yeah. So it swings and roundabouts. But their primary concern is ensuring the company has the cash flow to survive. Obviously, if they're a norm normal gas company, then they would have been severely stressed by the collapse in gas prices last yeah. year. And they also have this a billion dollar oak tree capital agreement, which we'll go into later. Now, the negatives. To my mind, the biggest negative is that rising gas prices, and gas prices are rising now, may reduce the willingness of sellers to part with their aging gas assets. Well, presumably that would, um, that would stop them from growing, but it would it would maintain that they would be able to maintain their dividend yield with the so. portfolio. Yes, but it would stop growing. Yeah. So the 
increased availability of capital to these na other natural gas shale drillers would mean they wouldn't have to turn to diversified gas and oil. Yeah. But given the kind of movement of capital towards ESG, I wonder whether that will actually happen. Yeah. Um, and arguably, this is really 50% a finance com company. And actually, the annual accounts are quite difficult to decipher. And you do have to take various leaps of faith that they will be able to um, continue with this business model. Yeah. The other downside, of course, is the um, withholding tax. Um, if you're a British um, shareholder, and so if you are a British shareholder, you should ideally hold it in a SIP. The other thing is, you know, this is not ESG. You are buying oil and gas companies. Um, and also, it's high debt. Now, that is fundamental to the business model, is they're buying these companies with debt and they're aiming to pay that debt off within 10 years. But nonetheless, they have um, rising debt levels. Uh, free cash flow yield of 32%, PE ratio of 9.1, the dividend increased by 7% in Q2 and is 14.3% up on the year. So, you know, the, they're very confident yeah. that they can grow this dividend. So here, you'll see that the natural gas is 91% of production, 8% nation, uh, natural gas liquids and 1% oil. So they're overwhelmingly a gas company. This is the arrangement with Oak Tree Capital. And you can see that Oak Tree Capital have committed a billion to enable diversified gas and oil to buy more assets. So Oak Tree Capital have clearly done a lot of digging on this company and they think that this is a sustainable business model. And when Richard asked about the funding model, so they diversified gas and oil identifies the assets, they buy them with the capital and it's 50-50 um, funding allocation. Okay. Now, what do they do? So you see here where the arrow points down to this little chart bottom left, that what they do is they buy these legacy natural gas wells, which should have the production profile shown in the gray dotted line. Yeah. And they specialize in trying to keep up production. So instead of declining, production actually stays flat. And then anything above the gray dotted line is profit. And so far, they have managed to do that. Although, of course, long, they won't be able to keep that up forever. But if they manage to do that for a few years initially, then that means that they are getting a lot more cash in at the front end. So they're very cash flow positive. And, and basically, presumably, Keith, they're actually getting, they're getting more oil or more gas, usually, more gas out of the well than the original operator would have done because they're using different technology. Precisely. It's, it's not necessarily different technology, Richard. It's more that they specialize in getting the most out of these old wells. So there are various economies of scale, you know, um, and if we go on to the next chart, this is the way they do it. And if you're interested, um, there's a whole section on the company website about how they do it. And it's about um, building new pipelines and getting to taking it to better markets uh, and squeezing the last drop out of all these, um, these wells. Um, but anyway, if you're interested, it's on the website. Yeah. This is the hedging book. And you will see that the hedging price obviously changes with the gas price. And 
despite the hedged price coming down over the last few years, they've made more profit. Now, the hedge, the gas price is coming back up again. Mm. So all these legacy properties, presumably when they re-hedge, they will get a better price for them. Yeah. The margins are astonishing. So you'll see they've managed to drive down their cash costs per million cubic feet. And they've got very stable margins of 50%, which is, you know, very good. That is a, a very high margin, isn't it? Sustainably. Also, um, they will, um, I presume they hedge for the period of the loan, if, they are able, if they're able to hedge that far out. I don't, honestly, Richard, that's one of the things that, you know, it's not entirely clear, to, it wasn't yeah. entirely clear to me. But how if they can hedge for the period of the loan then once the loan is repaid they won't need to hedge that that well again um but, but if they can't if they can't do it for that yeah. period of time then they are exposed at the point at which the hedge drops off well the thing is they are exposed to it for a certain percentage of their gas production yeah and they the durations of their hedges are were difficult to decipher for me anyway. Yeah. So <clears throat> here is the debt repayments. And so what they're doing, you'll see they've got very little cash. And all cash that comes in, they try and repay debt. They're either paid out as dividends or it's repays debt. And so they are constantly actually repaying debt, amortizing the debt. Yeah. These are uh, is this is a corporate history, so shows what they were buying. So you can see they bought Titan Energy in um, 2017, right. and then APX, CNX, etc., etc. They've been buying more and more. And last year they bought Carbon and EQT, and moved to a premium listing on the LSE, having previously been on AIM. Okay. Now, one downside of buying all these legacy assets is that you are liable, sorry, for the decommissioning of these wells. But the wells are very small and the average life of these wells is 50 years. So a lot of it is in the future, but they do have to decommission some wells every year. Right. But these wells are, are small, they are, top right you see that is what a gas well looks like and so you have to take off all the tubing you have to cap it and then you have to re-landscape and that typically costs 20 to 30 grand whereas if you had to retire an offshore oil well you know that costs you literally hundreds of millions yeah now one of the questions richard asked was about the debt profile and whether they would be exposed to rising interest rates and the answer is a bit so you see that the credit facility is libel plus yeah. but the longer term is fixed rate yeah. okay. so great ebitda cash margins and I notice they talk all the time about cash um, as opposed to earnings. And these, um, because it's a finance company, the annual accounts are quite difficult to decipher. There are lots of depreciation and amortization charges. So it's good that they fix their, um, obviously it's good that they fix their loan interest rates. It means that they can, assess the profitability of every yield of, of every uh, well on the basis of the interest cost because the major cost um, one of their major costs is their interest cost isn't it mm. which they have fixed so they will know whether the um whether any particular well is going to be profitable 
because they, they know without what their interest rate is. Yes. Uh, in the main, obviously, they've, they've got that uh, LIBOR loan, which is, which is a, a quarter, I think, of the total debt, roughly. Yeah. So these are the results, historic results, um, from Stockopedia, and you can see that the company has grown really fast. It's the last two years, isn't it, Keith, that it's really picked up? Yeah. Um, in terms of the magnitude of the of the business, is yeah. the 2020 estimate is that seems out of line with the growth rate in the past past few years. You're right. Don't know. Yeah. Um, but you see them. They massively increased their dividend. When you listen to the CEO um, interviewed, and that was in the, um, the CEO interview was in December, the one I listened to, he was talking about what a great year they'd had. Yeah. You know? So clearly, um, this is a growing company with a lot of confidence, and then it's just signed this billion dollar financing agreement. So the private equity company also thinks they're on a winner. Yeah. You see here the dividend history. You know, it's grown very quickly from two cents in 2016 to 14.7 this year. And the share price. Now, the one thing you know is that gas prices are now rising. They've increased the dividend over this period. And the shares yield 10.7%. And on that basis, the, I realize the shares have doubled since March. But if they continue to grow the company going forward, then they will throw off yet more cash. If you look at the uh, share price back in um, uh, mid-2018, mid which is a year and a half ago, it's the same as it is now, Keith. Yes, precisely. So the, the dividend has gone up. I can't remember from your number. The dividend has sort of doubled since then, hasn't it? Well, it's a, it's now fourteen point seven, so it's up thirty percent or twenty percent. But the also changed over that period of time. No, absolutely. But the other thing is the gas price is now rising in the US. Yeah. So in summary, this is an interesting company with very different business model to every other gas company, oil and gas company I've ever looked at. It's really a financing company that's looking to maximize free cash flow. Now, we have concerns that the free, free cash flow will be maximized by growing the company. As long as the, the company is growing, then it is getting new assets to which and there'll be initial uplift from each new asset which will provide it with short-term cash yeah. and so as long as it's growing as long as the as long as the and as long as the the um the cash generation profile of any given well is is uh, matches the debt repayment profile they haven't there isn't an issue in terms of the free cash flow but if the cash generation profile is up front uh, then you could get a misleading view of the of the cash position of the, in the future of the company. But looking at the the graph of the very slow, gentle decline that they're showing, that doesn't look like it's happening. It looks like their cash flow is spread reasonably evenly along the life of the well. Obviously, with a very a gentle decline. I agree, Richard. But if you look at go back to the chart which shows what they aim to do with each well here, you see that yep. they are squeezing this extra return out of these wells. Yes. And as long as they can do that, then you know, the more they grow the assets, the more they're getting cash up front. And you'll see that it's, there's this kind of slow decline, which is inevitable. They're not gonna be able to keep up production forever. And so you would expect this to start tailing off and that this area between the two lines, that's your value. Yeah. And so as long as you keep growing, you're growing that area and yeah. you're getting extra cash. Yeah. So we think that this company is in its growth phase and 
right now it's got an enormous dividend that's gr growing and in the short term at least looks very sustainable so frankly i have bought some and there are a lot of um there are a lot of whales waiting to move out of the um rapid production phase into the into the lowly production phase that is what this company feeds off isn't it so it's not like there's any shortage of, of um, potential candidates to purchase and also they're only based in appalachia yeah. you know they seem to be doing very well and presumably they can diversify into the permium into the you know all these other yeah. areas yeah. of uh, the us yeah. so there are growth opportunities. So anyway, an interesting company. Thank I have you. bought some, for better or for worse. And thank you, thank um, thank you very much for, for doing the research into it. Yeah, very welcome. Okay, well, thank you for listening. Um, I hope you'll join us again for more Share Talks. If you enjoyed that, this, please can you press like and subscribe to the channel. And we hope to see you again on the channel soon. So it's goodbye from Richard Wheater. Yes, goodbye from Keith Jordan. Goodbye. Goodbye. Full disclaimer. The material and information contained in this podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon for making a business, legal or any other decision. We may own or have a financial interest in any securities mentioned. Listeners should conduct their own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. Whilst we endeavour to ensure that the information presented on the show is correct, we make no representations or warranties of any kind, expressed or implied, with respect to the podcast and website or to any information, products, services or related graphics discussed or presented in the podcast or website. Any reliance you place on such material is strictly at your own risk. You are solely responsible for the investment decisions you make. We will not be responsible for any errors or omissions in the podcast or website, including in articles or postings, for hyperlinks embedded in messages, or for any results obtained from use of such information. Nor will we be liable for any loss or damage, including consequential damages, if any, caused by a reader's reliance on any information provided by the podcast or website. Please do not listen to the podcast if you do not accept self-responsibility for your actions.